Good afternoon, Cherries fans, and welcome to this special show here on Up the Cherries in All Departments. Now, before I do welcome on my special guest, here's a little bit about our sponsors, Dental on the Banks. To find out what they can do for you, visit dentalonthebanks.co.uk. So today we are looking into the Manchester City story and how it relates to AFC Bournemouth. Also, we'll be discussing about the formation of the Premier League, um, as well as the current day. And also reminiscing on a game back in 1999 between the two clubs. It ended in a nil-nil draw. And funny enough, it's the only, there's only two times that we haven't been beaten by Manchester City, and that was one of them. It is a pleasure, to, though, to discuss all these topics with one of the leading journalists for Manchester City. He's worked for the BBC for many years. He does quite a bit with Indian TV still. It is a pleasure to welcome onto the show Ian Cheeseman. Good evening, Ian. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you so much for being on this show. So the idea of this show is to talk about the Man City story. So getting to the point where you are now, um, where you are a dominant force in the Premier League, because it never used to always be like that. Um, so it'll be quite interesting to discuss that. But before we do go into the City story, um, do tell everybody a little bit about your career and background. Well, I should say that when I started watching City at the end of the 1960s and into the early 70s, the team had just won the First Division title, which is now the Premier League, of course. Uh, they'd just won the FA Cup, so the title was in 68, the FA Cup was in 69, and in 70 they did a, a cup double of the European Cup Winners' Cup, so they have won a European trophy, um, and also the League Cup. And uh, I idolised that team, Colin Bell, Francis Lee, Mike Summerby, and indeed went on to write Colin Bell's autobiography. I never dreamed when I was a little boy and idolised Colin Bell that one day I would be visiting his house every week and uh, getting to know him and becoming best friends with him and ended up writing his autobiography, but that's what I did. Um, I was uh, an obsessive fan from the, right from the beginning, and uh, by the time I was um, into my teens, I was a season ticket holder and started going to every away game, and essentially, apart from the games behind closed doors, although I did get into a few of those, um, I haven't missed a home or away game since the 1970s. Um, so I have seen City drop all the way down from that pinnacle of being uh, as good as uh, United in those days. You know, United won the, the uh, European Cup in 68, City won the league. So they were uh, much more on a par. Uh, crowd records, you know, attendances were fairly similar. Um, and then it sort of went over a cliff, really, um, once it got to the um, to the mid and late 70s. And City ended up being a bit of a joke team, really, in a way. You know, if they could find a way to fail, then they would. 
they went down into the third tier of English football, despite winning on the last day of the season, 5-2 at Stoke City. Um, and they just needed one of the teams above them to slip and all the other teams won. So they still went down. And we played, and, and I was there at every game in, in the lower the reaches at Macclesfield and, you know, as low as you could get. I do remember the game at Bournemouth, a nil-nil draw, mm-hmm. uh, which City had two players sent off. Jamie Pollock, yeah. who is seen as a, as a Queen's Park Rangers hero for an own goal. He scored for City that kept Queen's Park Rangers up one year. That's how good he was. Uh, and Kevin Horlock, who went on to score one of the goals at Wembley in the playoff final that year against Gillingham that earned City penalties and ultimately got them back out of that division. That day at Bournemouth at Dean Court, the old ground, yep. um, he, he was actually sent off for aggressive walking. Um, so basically he walked up to the referee <laughs> when Jamie Pollock got sent off and uh, I, I can still picture it in my mind and, uh, and the referee didn't like it so sent him off as well. So City got... A nil-nil draw, but we're down to nine men. Uh, the, the lowest point of that season, statistically anyway, was uh, the 19th of December, 1998, when City lost at York City 2-1, just before Christmas. And I think they were down to something like 13th in the third tier of English football. And if you just said to me that day that Manchester City would be where they are now, and of course, every other fan that was there that day, you would never, ever, ever have believed that that would happen. But uh, along came um, Taksin Shinawatra initially, um, who was clearly trying to use City as a way of um, escaping the trouble, shall we say, that he had in his own country. I'm not sure he actually had any money, so it was all smoke and mirrors. But what he did is he persuaded the... Uh, the shareholders, of which I was a very small shareholder at the time as well, probably had about £20 worth, but all the shareholders, all the little shareholders, all the big ones, to sell their shares to him, and he became the sole owner. And although he didn't really do anything that I would consider to be of any great worth, um, although I did bring Senor and Ericsson in and um, you know lift the spirits a little bit, what he did do is he made the ownership a lot simpler for new owners to deal with. So when Sheikh Mansur came along, instead of having to go through the whole procedure that Shinawatra did, of buying up shares and forcibly actually buying up shares, he was able to negotiate one-to-one and buy the club. And of course he did. And that was the day that City fans, City the club, who had been mega successful and had always had really good crowds, even when they were in the lower division, and of course, we're in what I consider to be second city of England. I know there'll be people in Birmingham who will claim otherwise, but as far as I'm concerned, culturally uh, and everything, Manchester is the second city of England. Um, and City United had always been, you know, neck and neck at different points in the history. But of course, City had fallen from grace. But now City were suddenly back on the uh, on the field again, and they'd seen what Chelsea had done. Chelsea had spent, spent, spent under Roman Abramovich and bought themselves, I think also been in the lower division, uh, the second tier, bought themselves a, a seat at the top table and started winning things. City did exactly the same, but then UEFA came along and um, introduced FFP, which I think was driven by the, the cartel of already established clubs who wanted to keep out the new boys. They'd, they'd let Chelsea get away with it, and didn't want another one coming to the table. It was too late to go back and stop Chelsea, but now they wanted to stop City from doing it. So they introduced FFP. The first couple of years, City knew it was coming. They spent for fun, bought Alano and eventually Yaya Toure and, and all, all sorts of other players, um, bodging off and you know d- different players that I could name, and and bought themselves a, a you know a seat at the top table as it were. Um, and now, of course, we're in a position where um, City won their case against UEFA, but the Premier League have continued on with uh, their investigation, so-called investigation, pretty much some of the same accusations that were made by UEFA, and are now trying to force that way through. Now, if you look on my channel, which is called Forever Blue, Ian Cheeseman, you'll see an interview I did with um, a, a, an accountant, the man who's 
been a shareholder at City, who I've known for a long, long time, and he's very credible, who did an, an in-depth interview about the accusations that had been made and how how much sort of ground they hold. But furthermore, they also did an interview with MP, um, Sir Mark Hendrick, who is a Labour MP, uh, just ahead of the white paper being issued, um, which he immediately said was designed to try to protect English football from Super League and that the timing of the white paper, because it was originally out a little earlier than it came out of Thursday, the week we're speaking, um, the white paper was meant to um, you know, take control of English football. So the Premier League preempted back that by bringing these charges out to yeah. sort of show that they had strength, that they had power, that they were taking things seriously. Um, and actually made mistakes even in the accusations that he made against City. It was it was so rushed, um, and it feels to me, Elizabeth, it's um, you know a power struggle now between uh, the Premier League and the government and the White Paper, and it feels as if this is going to go on for a little while yet. Um, it's ironic that um, City were the only one of the big clubs who welcomed a investigation and you know, a body that was neutral to actually look into these things. All the other cartel members, if I can call them that, wanted the Premier League to be in complete control themselves. And having seen what happened with UEFA, um, knowing what I know about the way that City operate and how professional they are, by the way, they'll also throw a lot of money at um, lawyers and all the rest of it. Um, I, I don't think City will, will lose this case. Um, all the, the sort of tabloid headlines of, you know, they'll be relegated out of the Football League and docked 50 points or whatever ridiculous things that they were suggesting. I don't for a ma imagine for a moment that any of that is going to happen. And even if, um, you know, they were found guilty by that neutral, you know, that their, their committee, if you like, that's meeting in private, City would immediately appeal it and this could drag on for ages. Um, so... Uh, that's a very long answer, and I'm sorry to give you such a long answer. Um, I mean, the only other thing I would say is that, you know, I, I, I don't know whether City have technically broken any rules. Um, maybe they have, and if they have, um, then, you know, you accept whatever punishment comes along. But what I would say is I'd be very surprised, um, and I don't mean this as a tribal thing, trust me, I don't mean it in a tribal way, but I'd be very surprised if all that, the members of that cartel, including their equivalents throughout Europe, haven't also break, broken or tried to bend every single rule that there is possible to break in terms of, you know, um, doctrine sponsorship and paying people from, from different accounts and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, you, you've only got to look at somebody like Bayern Munich, you know, who are part owned by one of their sponsors. Yeah. Uh, well, if that isn't a conflict of interest, what is, you know, but that... You know, state on. They talk about state on City and Newcastle. Well, what about Real Madrid and Barcelona, who've been funded by the Spanish governments for a long time? I, I, I'm a football fan, you know, and, and really, um, all I want to do is watch football. My team appreciate good football, the best players I can see, and um, all this sort of business talk and. Uh, and this obsession with with winning and maximising profit just mm -hmm. gets me down. Um, I, I just love. I, I grew up watching football, and love watching football. And if I actually thought about it too deeply, I know this sounds terribly negative, but if I if I if I thought about it too deeply, and you, you think about the money that the players earn and the fact that now you can't get anywhere near them, they live in a bubble. It's obscene, really, but we still love it because I like watching 22 men kick a ball about and, you know, and, and, and ideally not know what the score's going to be before the game's played, so it's exciting. So that's that's the root of where I am, but I can't help the fact that my club, you know, is, is where it is. I'm, I'm really delighted to have had the rocket ride, to have seen all the, the triumphs. Nobody can take the Aguero moment away from me in 2012 or... You know, travelling around Europe, like I'm still, as I'm talking to you now, I'm in a hotel room in Cologne, coming back from Leipzig. I get back on Friday night, and first thing Saturday morning, I'll be in the car driving down to Bournemouth. I'll be off to Bristol next Tuesday. It's my life, it's what I do. 
and, and I'm very, very grateful for the, um, you know, when would I get to go and see Colbit? So, you know, go, go, and go to Ukraine, as I did three times, uh, to Kharkiv, um, or the Faroe Islands, or, you know, I would never have been to these places had, it not, had I not had the excuse of watching uh, City. So that was a bit of a monologue, wasn't it? I'm really sorry. You no, that's... a question, far away. <laughs> no, it's very, very interesting. And to be honest, the next question is like a two-part bit. Um, one is current day, but also one part is in the past. If the Premier League are going to bring these charges against Manchester City, why not Chelsea? Exactly. I mean, Chelsea have, have, have just stretched the rules, shall we say, if, if yeah. they've not broken them, by signing players on extra long contracts so that they can amortise, I think is the word, the salaries and the fees that they've paid so that it's not, you don't pay it all in one go, you pay it all, in the case of uh, Fernandez over eight and a half seasons. So it's, it, if that isn't stretching the rules, if that isn't, it's like it's like people who they say are, are tax fiddling. Um, there are people who don't pay their tax, but there are people who create um, make creative ways of avoiding it. Yeah. And it feels like that's what's happening in modern football. Um, if City have, have, have literally, or any other club for that matter, literally broken a rule, and that rule is hard and fa fast and is legal then they should be punished. And if City are punished for something that they've done wrong, so be it. Um, because I'm a, an older, longer-standing fan, if City were playing back in the third tier of English football or whatever, it wouldn't make any difference to me. I'd still be going every week. It isn't just about winning to me. Um, in fact, it sounds awful to say this, but winning comes a bit boring after a while. Um, you know, when you've won four titles in five, you know, you think, oh, another parade through the streets, you know, and an, another trophy lift and, all. you know, what, what, what time will it be over? I want to get home. Honestly, it might not affect the younger kids like that who've never seen one before. And obviously the first one you have, I mean, when City won the league in 2012, I, I was commentating on all the games at that time for the BBC. So I actually commentated on the moment that Aguero scored. I went on the pitch afterwards into in all the team, Roberto Mancini, I was on the up and top bus with the players the day after. Uh, I was the only journalist that was allowed on the bus. I was interviewing players live on the bus. There were thousands of people in the city. That was amazing. But, you know, 10, 12 years on from that, they win the league again. And it's oh, right, oh, another one. You know, they won the league again. And I remember when, when City were not winning trophies. And believe it or not, us Blues still have United mates now and again. You know, and a United fan had said to us, be careful what you wish for. You'll be going to Wembley two or three times a year. It costs a fortune, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it's a nightmare going all the time. And you soon get bored of lifting all these trophies. Actually, the jeopardy and the you could lose this one is, is in a way more exciting. You know, the, I mean, the fact that this season, as we're speaking, City are just slipped up a couple of times, like, like at Nottingham Forest, actually makes it more interesting. Because last season, they were beating everybody about 4 or 5 nil. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? Well, we would love a little bit of a European tour. We'd love a final. So, um, you know, hopefully one day we'll get to one. But let's go back a step and to... Around about 1992, so the Premier League has just been formed. And the view of a lot of people was that the Premier League was designed for the likes of Manchester United. And I feel, and this is only an opinion, Man City actually become disadvantaged because of that. So what's your opinion on that? Well, obviously, one of the things that gets thrown at City, particularly by United fans, Liverpool fans and whatnot, is that the money that they generate is self-generated. You know, that they haven't got it from, uh, uh, you know, a sort of rich sugar, sugar daddy or whatever. But, as you are alluding to, at uh, the time when United were dominating English football and Liverpool were, were 
you know, close behind them. That's when all the money came into the English game. The Premier League um, went worldwide. So suddenly there was an audience everywhere in the world that hadn't been there before. And that generated a huge income boost to those big clubs. And it's a bit like when you're playing Monopoly. I'm sure everybody's played Monopoly at some stage. You all start off equally at the beginning, uh, but within probably half an hour or 45 minutes, somebody has been very lucky and landed on all the key properties. And it's very obvious at that point who's going to win the game. And yet the game probably goes on for another hour and a half with you know, somebody saying, I'll, you know, it's all right, I'll wash up, you carry on playing without me. Because you know that the way the game is going to end, it cannot win, it can't end any other way. United, Liverpool, um, Arsenal and, and Tottenham and, and, and the teams that were dominating at that time suddenly had this massive worldwide audience who wanted to buy merchandise and they were getting this extra, massive extra income boost from the early television money. So United would go out and buy Rio Ferdinand or you know, would, would, would go to Everton and sign the best young player they had in Wayne Rooney or whatever it might be. City couldn't do things like that, just comparing City and United. They they were they did you know, they were already on the decline in lower leagues and everything like that. Nobody was interested in them. You know, it was embarrassing for me when friends or relatives came over and they go, oh, We want to go and watch a football match, but they all wanted to go and watch United. Nobody wanted to watch City against Crew at Main Road. They wanted to watch United play, you know, somebody else. So and, and did they want to buy any merchandise? No, they go to the United shop and come back with a lot of stuff, but who wants, who wants anything from City? So United and, and the others had a massive advantage at that time because of the state of where it was. So if that's what you call generating your own kim, income, then fair enough, that, that's what they did. And um, City couldn't have caught up in the way that they did without the good fortune of Sheikh Mansur coming in. I personally, as a football fan, feel very blessed and lucky by that. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not an arrogant person. I don't expect anything. I just feel very, very lucky. And when I look around at other clubs like Newcastle, great, great fan base. Always love going up to St James's Park. Uh, when the the new money came into Newcastle United, um, I know there are question marks just as there have been about City's owners. But but the fact that it, regardless of where that comes from, because we can't control that, I just thought, how great is that for Newcastle? That they can, you know, that they can dream that they maybe it'll be their turn soon. Maybe they'll win some some silverware and and those long, you know, I won't say suffering, but you know those those loyal fans who've never had much to shout about. Then they could win a trophy this weekend, first first time for ages, um, you know. But they they could be in the Champions League next year. I'm so pleased for them. You know, Birmingham City got a new owner. You know, wouldn't that be you know big city club like that who've never been able to compete with? Why, why would I begrudge them that? And if that means City don't don't win for a bit or or ever again, frankly, I don't care. I, I, I'm I've had my glory years. I've I've seen them win the you know the the uh, the Premier League in the best possible way they could have done with a last minute winner on the day United would have won the title. It doesn't get any better than that as a City fan. So I wouldn't begrudge anybody else having that opportunity. And if if Bournemouth, I know you you know you've got new owners coming in. I know it's unlikely, probably because of the geography and the, you know, the the area that you're in, that that uh, you know a club can compete with the big city clubs down there. But if if let's just say the Saudi Arabians or the Abu Dhabis or the Qataris thought, you know what, you know, my mother-in-law grew up in Bournemouth or something, I'm going to buy them, I'm going to make them the greatest club in the world. Why would I have? A, I wouldn't have a problem with that in the slightest. In fact. You know, the rise up and the winning of the trophies would be delicious. You know, most people enjoyed Leicester winning the league, didn't they? Because it yeah. was something a little bit different. So now people hate City for all the success. The un- I mean, hate them if you like, that, that's that's your prerogative. But don't hate the fans, or certainly not the older fans, because it's nothing to do with us. We, we're just going along with the ride because we're just like you, really. We're just football fans who... Feel very fortunate. There'll be there'll be some younger ones now who feel very entitled, you know, because that's all they've ever known. And I can't say that, that sometimes make, makes me a little bit uncomfortable, um, you know, because they have a different attitude. But but certainly, you know, any city fan over the age of thirty, let's say, certainly thirty-five, 
knows what the struggles have been like and the the, the lows. And they're, they're just pinching themselves every time they go to a game. I can't believe they, when they sing songs like, you know, we're not really here. Um, we're the fans of the invisible man. We're not really here. And that one's just about the best song. You know, you, you know, going up, going down, going up. You know, the, 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 the self-deprecating. And I, and I love that humour of, of City fans. Um, so, and I never take it for granted. I remember when the Premier League started back in 1992, and I'm showing my age here, um, I remember City were a good, honest club. You had the likes of Nicky Summerby, of course, Mike Summerby's son, isn't he? Um, Geordie King Clatsy. Um, but it was always difficult. It always seemed like Manchester City, very much like Everton were as well. I know Everton didn't get relegated, but Everton were another one that fell cropper of the Premier League. Um, and this whole new creation. Um, what sort of things could they have done differently at that time just to make the league fairer? Because if you look at pre-Premier League, it was so much more open. Anybody could win that title. You couldn't say, because Man United were dominant for years, after that, you couldn't say, well, Man United are going to win that this year. Um, there was no dominance. What could they have done to stop that? I suppose there's a couple of ways it could have been done. I mean, if, uh, you, if you look at American sports and the way that they try to even out, uh, whether it be baseball, basketball or whatever, they have the draft system and they have wage caps. They, they have ways of, you know, it, 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 I'm not a huge American sports fan, but I have a, a bit of an interest in baseball. And when I go over to on holiday to Disney or something, I go and watch Tampa play a game. Yeah. And you go to their stadium and uh, it's half full. Uh, it's not really a passion. It's not like going to the New York Yankees or the Chicago Cubs or somewhere like that. Yet, you know, there was one season, I remember not too long ago, where, you know, they, were, they finished bottom of their division and probably had one of their worst records in the sport. And then that summer, because they'd done so badly, they had first pick at all of the, the, the new players. And the next season, they got to, like, if they didn't get to the World Series, they were certainly very close to it. That couldn't happen in England because because it's all about money. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the big clubs will, won't vote for Christmas. So I'm afraid it's too late now, um, unless the government actually brings in legislation, which I, I don't think they will do. But, you know, to, to actually get it even again and make it an even, you know, maybe you have a franchise, I don't want a franchise system, but maybe you have 20 clubs in the in the top division. They all have exactly the same amount to spend on players. And that's, that's one of the ways that you can even it out. I'm afraid as soon as, you know, Sky came along and all that extra income came along, the ones who were successful at that moment just raced off into the distance and, and as I say with that monopoly thing you know it, the teams that are in the Champions League they're getting such a, an amount of money for being in the Champions League so even with FFP sending saying you can only spend what you've earned you know even if that 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 worked fairly then by definition the the, the teams that finished top four two or three times in a row Get, get such a huge step forward that nobody is ever going to catch them unless they very badly mismanage or somebody who is an absolute genius can work on a shoestring and and get them get their team into that into that top echelon but it feels like every year that goes past that gap gets bigger so uh, it there's no simple answer as to what could have happened in 1992 to make it different um, but I, I guess wage caps, um, you know, spending limits, that type of thing, R rather than this FFP, which is just a, a bit stupid, really. If you're going to do it, you, then you, you say, right, each club has a budget of that. Yeah. And that's that's all you can spend in that year. And then and then it's even. So Bournemouth can spend the same... Same as City, but that, then that becomes even more complicated because then you say, well, yeah, but Bournemouth don't earn as much. So, you know, it, 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 there's, there's no way around it really, is there? And I guess 
the EFL, um, because they've got very different rules as well, aren't allowing those clubs to dream. You know, those clubs that do have this investment. Um, say, for example, um, I know they're Man United ex players, but Salford have been pretty much tied down. Um, you look at the likes of Reading as well, a team that does have money but can't spend it. And do you feel were punished, weren't they, for, for, they were. for spending? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, obviously the, the, the difference is that the, the amount of money that's generated in the AFL is nowhere near the Premier League level, so the disparity is a lot less anyway. Um, but, you know, in a way, you can almost argue that watching, you know, the, the Football League clubs is more fun because it's less predictable. I mean, at the beginning of this season... Would you necessarily have predicted that Burnley? I mean, Burnley benefit from the parachute payment, of course, so that does make a difference. But would you have necessarily predicted that Burnley would be romping away with it? Sheffield United be second, and you know that Norwich City would would have dropped back a little bit. You'd think that they would be right in the hunt because they'd be on parachute payments. Uh, you know, and, a, and a, if you go down an even lower division and you look at League One and League Two, you'd, you'd be even. I mean, I talk, I've talked down the years to many football league managers. You know, I remember covering Rochdale quite a lot and talking to Keith Hill at the time. And I remember Stockport and Rochdale playing each other in a playoff final. And Stockport in, took a gamble, a smaller gamble than the Premier League do, because Leeds famously did that and paid the penalty. But, but Stockport took a gamble and overspent and won in that playoff final against Rochdale and were promoted and Rochdale stayed down. And Keith Hill, the Rochdale manager, was furious that his club, which was well run and only spent what it could earn, uh, couldn't compete with Stockport County. But then Stockport County got into financial trouble, cascaded down through the leagues, ended up two divisions below the Football League and only now are back in the Football League many years later rebuilding, ironically winning at Rochdale last week in a league game, but, you know, rebuilding and, and, and going back again. Um, so, you know, I suppose, you know, the, the Football League, what I'm saying is the Football League is, it still has failings in some ways, but at least it has that thing where when you go to a game, you're not quite sure what's going to happen and there isn't that massive disparity. You know, I mean, like I say, if I, if I talk to, to I go, I live near Oldham Athletic. Yeah. If I go and talk to all the, the people at Oldham Athletic and they'll say, well, we can't, we can't compete with Wrexham, you know, in this division, you know, with the Hollywood money and all the rest of it. Um, so there's still a disparity, but it's not as big as it is, uh, you know, in the Premier League. And of course, Oldham Athletic, one of the founding members of the Premier League as well. So it shows how quickly clubs can fall. But also in the EFL, a lot of clubs, say, for example, Southend United um, are in front of HMRC next week with a £1.4 million tax bill that needs to be paid. And... Is there, is there a way football can help stop that completely? Um, I know, yes, they've been mismanaged, but is there a way that maybe we can stop that as Premier League clubs? The white paper is supposed, one of the things it claims is that, that there will be a cascading of finances down the club, uh, down the leagues. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm City, I'm just making the observation. Um, it'd be a bit like um, going to Asda or Tesco and saying the corner shop round the corner is struggling a little bit. You know, can you give them some of your profits to help them keep going? Um, you know, Asda and Tesco are going to say, why would we do that? Unless they were made to do it. So if the government wants to make the big clubs do it, then, yeah, I mean, it's bizarre that, You've used South End as an example. 1.5 million gets them out of the doo doo. Um, what's that? About a month's wages for for, for one of City's players, top yep. top City's players. They have a stadium um, at the CFA, the City Football Academy, which has an 11,000 capacity. Um, you know, Berry went out of existence. Um, all of them are struggling. In theory, one of those two clubs could play their home games at the CFA. 
the facilities are probably better than they have at Gig Lane and Boundary Park. But are they going to do that? Of course, they're not going to do it. They've got under soil heating on the training pitches at City. They've got 14 training pitches at CFA. They might not all have under soil heating, but I think four or five of them do. And certainly the, the, the stadium where the women and the under 23s and the youth team play, the CFA stadium has under soil heating. So when you get into the middle of winter, and the game at Rochdale's off, and the game at this place is off, and the game at that place is off. City's under 23s will play, no problem, because they've got under soil eating. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice to to say to Rochdale, you know, on, on the Thursday, well, it's freezing this weekend, your, your game's in trouble. Why don't you shift the game? We'll play it at our CFA. We'll open the doors for you, let you play. That's never going to happen, that, because that's not the world we live in. It's, it's an unfair world, and... Um, I mean, yeah, there'll be, of course, difficulties in, in re rearranging something at a short notice. I'm not saying it would be easy. I'm talking about the principle, really, of helping yeah. a smaller club. And um, it's just not going to happen, is it? No, it makes perfect sense, to be honest, Ian. Um, of course, we have got this investment and, you know, we are dreaming. What could this football club aspire to be because of course we have got not the old Dean Court back in 99 that you probably visited um, when Steve Fletcher believe it or not Eddie Howe played in that game as well um, so a young Eddie Howe James Hayter um, amongst many others that we'll remember but of course it's a newer complex but still it's not up to Premier League standards we, we appreciate that is the first thing that Bill Foley needs to do is sort this stadium out to actually propel this club into something that you could say is a Premier League football club. Yeah, I mean, in the short term, um, the most that Bournemouth can aspire to is to be where Fulham are at the moment or Brighton are. In other words, be exceptionally well coached and recruitment exceptional. And then you can maybe dream of getting into the this new conference European League, which I've got to say, I don't really agree with anyway. I mean, no. there's too many of these things, uh, but or the Europa League or, or whatever. If if that and and I, and I said that not just because you know you've said already you love to go on a European tour, but that the it, it, it all becomes about the extra funding. You get into the Europa League, you get extra fixtures, you get extra team money, TV money. You 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 know more European wide. You become more attracted to players and coaches coming in. So the whole thing becomes a little bit of a snowball to really aspire to be up with the top dogs. First of all, you've got to circumnavigate the rules of FFP because nobody yep. will want you. All the big clubs won't want you. The last thing they want is you coming in there and knocking them out of the Champions League, isn't it? So they'll do everything they can to stop you. Um, but to, to really compete, you know, you've got to build a 60,000 stadium. You've got to be capable of filling it every week. And you, and then then you can start to compete if you become the you know the Liverpool, the City, the United, the Real Madrid of the South Coast, you know, and you can draw in people from Southampton and Portsmouth. I know sacrilege saying that, you know, but <laughs> whenever you draw people from, yeah, and you can fill that stadium, maybe a few down from London or South London or whatever, then that's the that's the only way that truly you'd be able to to compete with where, where City are. But all the big clubs, including City, will try and stop you. To be honest, we've got such a good catchment area here because there's no football league clubs at this moment in time unless Yeovil go back up in Somerset. The closest is Southampton. Um, we have got such a big area and I think that's part of the attraction. But at the moment, we are still a very, very small club. In fact, I think fans, opposition fans, actually really like Bournemouth being around because we are so small. Yeah, maybe. I mean, as a fan who goes home and away and has done all my life, getting a ticket for Bournemouth is a nightmare, as yeah. it is getting a ticket for Brentford, because the two clubs are so small and have such small you know, segments of fans you know, a portion for away fans that I'm lucky enough I've got a ticket, but I know plenty of people who would love to. I'll be travelling down on my own on uh, 
on on Saturday because nobody else that I know who might come down can get a ticket. So I've got a long drive down and a long drive back. Um, so, but if you if you're a consumer who doesn't go to away games and you just generally watch on TV, in theory the romance of watching a Bournemouth or a Brentford or a Fulham with their old ground on the on the river there or what it, it, you know that it, that is nice. But then there's the arrogance of the new younger fans who just wants to, who, who may have even signed up for the Super League. I've even heard a few suggested, oh, if City get done by the Premier League, let's just leave them behind, go and form the Super League. I don't, I don't want to watch City playing Real Madrid, you know, four times a year. And uh, no, I, 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 I'm, and and that that probably just switch me off. That'd be the end for me. Um, I think if City went out of domestic football. Um, I don't mind having the European competitions, but I don't. The centre should always be the domestic leagues, and 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 I love the, you know, the games against different types of clubs. So coming to Bournemouth on Saturday, uh, you know, in theory it'll be a small, intense. I mean, I've been there many times. I've been, I've been to every time City have been there. There's not been that many of them, I know, but I've been every time City have played at Bournemouth since the seventies. So you know, I've had the experience. I know what it's like. In fact, I. When I was working at the BBC, I came down there with other clubs like Wigan and Rochdale, whoever would have played there. So I've been there many, many times. And so in my head, um, going to a place like Bournemouth is, is, is different than going to Anfield or Old Trafford, you know, because it is, it's, it's proper fans. It's not corporate. It's not, you know, a lot of people going holiday makers and oh, I want to be seen at Bournemouth and put myself on Instagram. You know, the, the people that I'll be walking around seeing at the stadium will be people who've been going to Bournemouth all their life probably and um, and and haven't jumped on the bandwagon of being a big, a, full, a fan of a big club. And, and all credit to them. I, I, I admire those people. When I, when I go to Boundary Park now and again, when City aren't playing and they play like Gates said or something like they did a couple of weeks ago, and you see 50 people behind the goal. And I look at them and I go, they're my type of people. I love them people. You know, they've come down here on a Tuesday night or whatever, 50 of them, probably expecting to lose. It's pouring down with rain. You know, they've had to take a day off work. That's what I was doing. when I've done exactly the same as them. I admire those people. And they're not doing it for the glory. You know, they're doing it for, for the love of the club and for the fun of just being a foot, an ordinary football fan. And, and so I'm looking forward to the trip to uh, to Bournemouth, to what I still call Dean Court this weekend. Yeah, I still call it Dean Court. I, will n- I don't call it the vitality. I don't call it the vitality. It's never been the vitality or the gold sands that it was beforehand as well. Um, it's what we've been through, and it's actually the journey... You know, when we look back on the journey, that's the most marvellous thing is going from minus 17, nearly falling out of the Football League. If we fell out of the Football League, you know, there's contrasting opinions. Would we have survived? Some people say no. Some people say yes. Eddie Mitchell, former chairman, said we would have survived. But let's be honest, we wouldn't be here today um, in the Premier League. to get to this very point and, you know, to be on the same field as players like Bernardo Silva, um, Erling Haaland, you name them, um, is just amazing. And, of course, being to every single game down here at Dean Court, you probably remember that uh, Charlie Daniels goal that actually sent us into Raptors. It was amazing, that one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't think City played Bournemouth on the other... Where did you play? There was another ground you played at when Dean Court was being renovated. Dorchester. Dorchester, was it? Yeah. I remember going to a game, covering a game there when Bournemouth were there. It wasn't a City game. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've seen the full journey. Um, but as I say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. They're a, they're, they're a proper club, proper fans. Uh, when City first got this lottery win if that's what you want to call it uh, i remember saying to fans uh, be careful what you wish for now because you may well get all your dreams come true win all your titles and everything see the best players in the world bring it on i'm looking forward to it too but i'll bet you in 10 years from now 
this club will be unrecognisable and will have morphed into all the things you call United for all the other big clubs. You know, getting tickets will become harder and harder. The, the amount of dispute that there is. Let's say City get a thousand tickets for an away game. You know, the, the amount of fans that are upset by the fact that they've been going as long as I've been going and they can't get hold of a ticket. And yet I, I see in the away end, you know, people who clearly have never been to a match before in the away end. Yeah. You know, when you see them doing selfies and leaving 10 minutes before the end because they don't care who wins, that can be a bit soul destroying. But that's the price you pay for, for being a big club. Yep, definitely. Well, hopefully one day we will be there. We're on the start of the journey, so fingers crossed. But thank you so much for coming on the show, Ian. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And just before you go, please do tell everybody, I'm going to make you a full screen for this, do tell everybody where they can find you on YouTube because it is a really good channel. Well, the name is Ian Cheeseman, like it sounds, Cheese and Man. It's my name, even though some people might think it's made up or whatever. Ian Cheeseman, and I use the net, the title Forever Blue. I do a weekly City podcast, audio podcast, which usually I get ex-players on or whatever. So this week, for example, on Sunday, Dennis Stewart will be my special guest, but we have a couple of fans on as well. Um, I've had Ned and Manure on and um, all, all sorts of different people in, 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 in every week. Um, and then I do a match day vlog in which you, I go to every single game, of course. They'd won at Leipzig this week, be down at Bournemouth at the weekend. And I talk to fans, um, if particularly at home games, if I bump into ex players or managers or celebrities who are at the game, I'll get a few words from them as well. Um, uh, what was the guy called who, um, who was in Titanic, the bad guy? Billy Zane. Bumped into Billy Zane, for example, at, at one City game and got him on the vlog. You know, so whoever's knocking about, um, I'll, I'll get on and just just ask them questions about the game and before and after. And sometimes I'll do interviews with with people as well and stick them on the channel. So those are the two things that I do. Um, check them out if you like them. Uh, subscribe; it's free. Uh, give us a thumbs up, and it's certainly what I'm very determined to do in the work that I do is. Uh, especially because of the background that I had of being at the BBC for so long and being, and still being a journalist. I, I do some work for Indian Television, Champions League and FA Cup ties. Because I try to respect everybody I speak to and it isn't a channel that's full of swearing and anti-everybody else. It's, it's real people giving real views. So um, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you and hopefully I'll see you at the game and get you on my channel. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. And by all means, let me know where you are and I will be on. And all the links, guys, are is in the description below. So please do go and subscribe to Ian's channel. But likewise, Ian, all the very best for the rest of the season. Of course, after Saturday, I should say. But it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. And thank you so much for joining us. Well, good luck uh, to, to you um, and to the channel and, of course, to your club as well. And and um, may the best team win. That's what I always say. Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on the show. Please do remember to hit the like, the subscribe, the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos we do here on Up the Cherries in all departments. Please do check out our opposition preview show with you. That will be also on the channel listing here. Also, we have had lots of interviews. Of course, Charlie Daniels was on the show. And of course, he scored that goal against Manchester City. So do watch that. Do watch the Eddie Mitchell interview as well that was referred over to as well. Um, and there's lots, lots more as well. Of course, Big Fletch was on here as well. So, yeah, you, you've got to check him out. I'm sure you all have, to be fair. But until the next show, thank you for joining us. And up the cherries. Mm -hmm.